today we're going to transition. We're going to complete our little discussion about uh, women in leadership, which was, as you probably know, a rabbit trip that we got on to in Kansas. I uh, used to have a, uh, a mentor who said that uh, pastors should not go down rabbit trails. He said, but there's a lot of good hunting sometimes. <laughs> that you, you would think and that you would desire to be biblical. And I, I, I want to remind you that there is this continuum and in that continuum there is some extreme and some moderate and it is important that you recognize where we are, where we are as a church, okay? Because, you know, we, we, we want to be more than anything. We want to be a biblical church. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to say this. I've kind of thought about it. I've been thinking about today and how we can bring this to a close. And some of you remember May this all, don't you? Yeah, Miss May. Yes. Miss Mavis was a most interesting person. Uh, one of the <clears throat> I had only been here before. About three. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I had only been here for about three or four months, and uh, when I, and, and Joy's mom and dad had one of those avocado green telephones. <laughs> That were still in the rotor, you know, the rotary type. So we were we were moving into Joy's mom and dad's house to come back here and and I heard and I heard something and it was it was so the ringer didn't work on the phone, but I recognized it. that's the phone, I think. So I picked it up and and I said, of course, hello. And on the other end, somebody said, if you, <clears throat> if you want the, the horses to come to the barn, you have to put the hay out. Now, we have seen. 
said, and I want to go back over it, that we, you know, that you find over here the, the more fundamentalist kinds of churches, the people who are, I would say, like fundamental Baptists. Will, will, I've seen in a lot of fundamental churches where, you know, honestly, uh, the pastor teaches men how to walk so that they don't appear feminine and they do not allow women to speak in the church. And, I've seen, I've seen that, uh, and not just in the fundamental Baptist, but in, in some of the other um, kinds of stronger um, reformed churches. Um, maybe not to the extent of the fundamentalist Baptist, but over here on this hand, you have like the PCUSA, which is a militant feminist. That the, the, the promotion of women in leadership is done militantly. The the Peace USA made a declaration that they were they were going to advance women, put women in ministry and women in leadership positions. The United Methodist Church, same way, the United Church of Christ and others, some of the more mainline denominations are over here. So the EPC is a combination of both of these. And the EPC said, this is the, kind of the funniest and most difficult thing, the EPC said, we're never going to get together on, on this matter because we really need to be, we need to be biblical. We need to be, but we also need to be caring. Now, the motto of the EPC, and I'm not trying to promote the, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, I'm trying to tell you how the EPC dealt with it. The EPC said, in essentials, unity, non-essentials, what? Does anybody know what it was? Liberty. And in all things, charity. In all things, charity. Or love. So let's, let's just kind of see what that means. Essentials are the things that define orthodox Christianity. These are the fundamentals of the faith. Now, I want to ask you, do you know what orthodox means? Body. No. Ortho. Think about ortho. Oh. Uh, straight. Orthodontics means that you're getting your dentics fixed, right? your, your dent, dental work. So orthodontists, straight teeth. Orthopedists, fix bones, straighten bones, line them up, put them together. Orthodoxy, doxy is worship. We talk about the doxology, right? So orthodoxy means the right kind of worship which is because of the right kind of beliefs are defined in the essentials. And we have a statement of faith in the EPC that talks about the things like the, the fundamentals of who Jesus Christ is, the Trinity, the, uh, the, the teachings on the Scripture, that they are reliable and dependable and trustworthy and infallible and inerrant and all of those things we believe about Scripture. Things that I've been teaching you uh, in in uh, in our theology class. Non-essentials would be in those things that are not necessary to Christianity, but they distinguish us, perhaps, because we hold certain body of beliefs that make us different from Baptists, okay, or different from Methodists. In those non-essentials, we say there is liberty. Meaning, you don't have to be just like me. You don't have to think just like me. And in all things, we are going to have love or demonstrate love. That's the, that's the way we came to resolve this. So now here's where we are on the matter of complementarianism and egalitarianism. As a denomination, I would say that probably we are somewhere along here. Okay? Meaning that the, the denomination, since we've had such 
and uh, what do you call it, um, an exodus from the PCUSA into the EPC, the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, it has moved or shifted the denomination over to more and more egalitarian position. Uh, I think prior to that we were we were right down the middle, but now maybe a little bit more. As a church, I don't know where you would put Hollywood Church, but I would put Hollywood Church somewhere about in the same place as the rest of our denomination, to be honest, just a little bit more egalitarian. Meaning that we are, we do not have militant feminism as something here. Uh, instead, I think what we do have is a godly feminism of, uh, and a recognition of joint, the value of joint leadership between men and women. That there is something to be gained in the understanding that. Uh, women can bring to uh, a, a group decision and that men can bring in, uh, in, in a group decision and the debating back and forth, all of those things. Does that make sense? Yeah, to y'all. And what we do not have here that I have seen is what, you know, frankly is a Jezebel kind of an attitude, which is that sort of like, I'm going to have my way in. I, call it, you'll line up. I think it's maybe been here. I don't mean that bad. I think it might have had some little appearances in years gone by, but not right now. So that's kind of where it is. Now I'm going to tell you how I think, um, for me, I'm going to just put where I am, okay? What do you think I am? Married to Joy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really grounds oh, me. Joy. <laughs> oh my goodness. We had the funniest thing this morning. Uh, you know, sometimes you don't have to do anything to get in trouble. Have you ever done <laughs> I walked by, but the bread bag was left open. What did you do? And I said, what? She said, the bread bag left over. And I said, I don't have any idea of what it is. She said, it was a, it was closed yesterday. And I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, so I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But she called me by the way. She said, oh, I had a low blood sugar. But I started off this morning like, what? What? <laughs> so I am married to Joy. And we do have those kinds of things. If this is the middle, I want to tell you where I am. I'm right along here. I'm serious. Just barely egalitarian. And I'm going to tell you why. I've already said that the complementarian argument is basically what we would call from directive teaching or the kind of teaching that is I do not permit a woman to teach in the church that's uh, Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2 women should keep silence in the churches and these as 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14 so there are certain passages that are what we would call directive teaching over here on this side I've said most of the of the context is narrative teaching meaning that this is where this, you have the stories of women who are in leadership. In the church of Philippi, you have women who are in leadership in, in the book of, of Romans, in the 16th chapter. You have examples in Acts chapter 19 of Priscilla and Aquila and other certain people that are shown to have leadership. So over here, you know, I've said to you that this does not trump that. Because you can get in trouble when you, when you base your theology upon narrative instead of upon direct. Let me give you an example. Okay. So do you all remember me talking about my friend a long time ago named Stuart? 
Yes. Your name is Stuart. He's your wisest person. <laughs> Stuart was Stuart was the, the crazy guy who I used to have some bantering uh, discussion about matters with. But he, he said to me, he's the one who said to me once, uh, he said, uh, you all, you all have got, uh, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, I'd rather have the Holy Ghost than the Holy Spirit. And I said, Stuart, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost are the same person. No, I got the Holy Ghost. He said, I'd rather have the Holy Ghost than Jesus. I said, Stuart, you lost your mind. And we had those kind of discussions. I think it was just good for me to be able to get my voice raised up a little bit in a higher pitch and to be amazed at how doctrinally off he was. But Stuart um, was a fellow who was a kind of costly. And this is how he came to the decision about speaking in tongues. Now listen to this carefully. He said that the and the Pentecostals teach this that there were Christians who were saved, the disciples were saved when Jesus was on the earth, right? So they were saved, but they didn't have the Holy Ghost until the day of Pentecost. Because then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came. And when the Holy Ghost came, they began to speak in tongues. And so whenever anybody gets the gift of the Holy Ghost, they speak in tongues. And so if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost, and you are an incomplete Christian. Now see, that's, the, that's an example of coming up with false doctrine based upon a narrative. You follow that, right? So what I'm saying is you cannot do that. However, I'm not trying to base a doctrine of egalitarianism. I'm trying to see that there is in the Bible that there was God who was at work in bringing women into a higher profile of leadership. So for me personally, I think that this particular time in the Bible was a culture that was, <clears throat> that was male-dominated. It was like a culture that was that was also, I would say, um, class dominated. Meaning that there were slaves. Okay. Now, in in the scripture, the directives that are given, I think, are given in the context of that culture. For example. Paul himself permits and allows and speaks of slavery in a way that is permitting it. He's not endorsing it, but he's permitting it. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. He is, he is working within the, of the, the norms of his culture, knowing, perhaps, by the Holy Spirit, maybe, maybe not, but God eventually was going to, through the gospel, to change the culture to where the class-dominated culture would be changed. And I think that, in a similar way, I think that the gospel has been at work to bring about a change in the male-dominated uh, structure within the church. That maybe I might be totally wrong. I could be off. This could be the right position. But I'm just telling you that how I've gone back and forth on this issue. Does it make sense to everybody? Yes. Do you have any question or comment? Because we're about to leave. I, I just think we have to be careful how we make doctrinal. To, uh, um, develop doctrinal positions based on narrative because narrative would tell me that I could narrative would tell me that, do, that I could have more than one life mm -hmm. um, very true <laughs> and, and, yeah. 
since Linda's not here, I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a, a legitimate point. Do you understand why this is a difficult subject? Because, you know, and, and Giles and I have had, we were having a conversation about this very thing. And that was one of the things that we were discussing was that it was permitted to have more than one wife in certain times in the Bible. But at the same time, the gospel at work and Jesus bringing about a change in that with his teaching began to bring it to an end. So, in some, it sounds like a puppy dog. Some like a turkey and me. <laughs> and, and the interesting part of Jesus' narrative is that, you know, he, that from the beginning that was never so. That's right. Because funny. of the hardness of your heart. So he could say that some narrative that he was, might wind up being based on the hardness of our heart. That is so true. You all missed that. So, what John is saying is that. What's that like? I'm, I'm having to deal with the turn. <laughs> it's Wanda. It's Wanda. It's Wanda. Okay. Oh my gosh, we need to talk to her. She needs to wear some different kind of pants or something. <laughs> She's got a good son. She turns the water faucet up. Oh, is that what that is? So, what Giles said was that it was like in one of the case of where there was uh, more than one wife. Jesus said from the beginning it was not meant to be that way. You remember he said that. Uh, but because of the hardness of your heart, God per permitted it. So in some cases, the cultural thing is, is an allowance of things that God really never intended. So we have to be careful. And he's, I think, I, I think he's you know, putting the flashing light up in a good way because this is really the way that I honestly see this in the scripture. So we just have to be thoughtful about it. And you know, I'm saying this to you because I love you. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to be retiring one of these days. Hopefully it's going to be a long time. I hope y'all go slow on the pulpit search committee. <laughs> just say it. But when I do, you're going to have candidates that are going to come in from different positions. And you need to be a thinking church. And you need to be a, a work from the core of your convictions. And you need to be able to explain why you believe what you believe. And it cannot be, well, we've always been that way. Because that's the wrong answer. You know that, right? That's what happened in the Reformation. The Catholics, the Roman Catholic Church, when they were confronted with the truth of the gospel from Martin Luther and from the other reformers, that this is what the scripture says, this is what the Bible says, and they argued for the position of the Bible, the Roman Catholic Church said, but we have our tradition. And the tradition that we're talking about was their written documents and their written decisions through the years. And Martin Luther and the other reformers came along and they said to those people at that time, no, we must be sola scriptura. What does it mean? Scripture alone. Scripture alone. And it must be for the glory of God alone. There you go. And do you remember the other solas of the Reformation? Sola Scriptura. <coughs> Sola Christus. Sola Christus, which is Christ alone. Mm -hmm. What is it? Sola Fide. So faith alone. Faith alone. What's the, there's another one.
So anyway, there you go. We're going to finish this up right now. It's all over with. We're moving on. And now we're going to talk about something that is related to anthropology or the study of man that is extraordinarily important that you begin to see. And that is the whole matter of original sin. Okay. Original sin. Tell me, what is original sin? Not what is the original sin, but what is original sin? You've heard the term? Y'all have heard the term. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Okay. So, Adam and Eve, you know, I always like to draw. So. <laughs>
he was a perfect representative of the human race because he had no taint of sin in him. He had no terrible circumstances. You know, the, the argument that people have about whether uh, our behavior is more affected by heredity or by uh, environment. You, you know what I'm talking about? Well, here, he, Adam had no heredity. I don't even think Adam probably had a navel. Think about that. And I don't, he didn't have a bad environment. He had a perfect environment. And yet he still will. So when he did fall, ever since then, sin has been a resident inside of all of humanity. And so the church recognized that this is a big problem and felt that it needed to be addressed. So here are some of the failed attempts of how the church dealt with the matter of original sin. Number one, first thing they did was they denied it. Okay, so there was a doctrine at one time where people said, look, this is every person is responsible for his own sin or her own sin. They quoted from the book of Ezekiel that says the sins of the father are not laid to the sins of the children or so forth. This was by a man whose name was Pelagius. And later by a man, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, so this doctrine was a denial of original sin. It was debated in the church that no, you can't get away from the fact that if we have something inside of us that points us to do wrong all the time. And uh, so the second thing, they tried to deal with it in the following ways. For one, by baptism. Okay, so the church said, all right, so babies are born into this world and they have the stain of original sin. So what can we do that will help them. So the Roman Catholic Church said when you baptize a baby, when you baptize a baby, you put that child into a position of neutrality, meaning that they no longer have original sin. They are just neutral at that point. That's what the Roman Church still teaches. The reason why Baptism is so important in the Roman Catholic Church is because the Roman Catholics teach that that baby, until it is baptized, that baby is under the condemnation because of original sin. You need to get that baby baptized right away so that it'll reverse that and put that child into a position of neutrality. Now that doctrine is nowhere taught in Scripture. You know that. It's just something that seems good and you're trying to deal with something here that's called original sin. So the reformers and the people who are the, the leaders of the group of people that we are, the, we are a reformed church. The reformers said that's just, that's just baloney. It's just not biblical. It's just not right. There isn't. And besides that, and they said this, and it is genuinely true what they said. If this was true, then, now think about it, it's a terrible thing to say, but the best thing that we could do would be to baptize children and kill them. Why? They would never sin. They would never have sin. They would all be guaranteed to go to heaven. And guess what? The Roman Catholic Church did do that. In Russia, they led a group of crusaders in the 1500s under the, the time of Peter the Great and even a little bit before that. They went into Russia where there were all of these either heathen or uh, there were Muslims there. So the Roman Catholic Church goes in 
and says to them, have you been baptized? Say no. no. So you haven't been baptized. Well, don't you want to be baptized? Say no. Okay. So you know. <laughs> All right. Well, what we're going to do is... Get louder and try to get it on tape. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to be baptized. So the Roman Catholic Church would then seize her and baptize her anyway. And since she didn't want to be baptized, they would just hold her down until she drowned. Why? Because they were zealously advancing their doctrine that at least by doing this, they were saving a soul. <laughs> Tell me, is that crazy? Or crazy, what? crazy. But, and that's one reason why Christianity is hated so much in certain parts of the world. It's because of that teaching, that doctrine. So, but let me explain something. If, if that doesn't work, then you, what does happen to children when they die? If they have original sin, do children go to heaven when they die? Yes. Yes. Well, wait, wait. You've got to think about it. Because, again, if you say that is absolutely certain, I'm not saying it's not. As a matter of fact, we're going to get into it. But if you say yes for certain, would we not be doing a favor to kill children? No. no. Why? We would be keeping them from the darkness of eternal perdition. We would keep them out of hell. If we could just kill them when they were young, they would go to heaven. And we would save a whole bunch of people from eternal suffering. You see what I mean? You but it would be worth it for me to kill somebody to save another person. There Jesus, isn't it Jesus <laughs> died to save other people, didn't he? Because didn't Paul say I would willingly give up my life and go to hell if it would mean the salvation of the Jews? I'm not you know I'm not advocating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get you all to think a little bit about these doctrinal things because they do have certain ramifications. All right, hang on just a minute. So the Catholics, the Roman Catholics, said that baptism puts a person in the position of neutrality. The Lutherans, not under Martin Luther, but under his successor, his name was Philip Melanchthon, the Lutherans said there was regeneration. So we call this baptismal regeneration. That generation, this means life. So the, the Lutherans taught and teach that when you baptize a baby, it doesn't just put them in a position of neutrality. It actually saves them. So they are saved. They are, they are genuinely saved. Now that qualifications for baptism in the Lutheran church or it must be that that parent has to be a believer himself or herself in order for that to take place. Now, you say, well, that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is, actually. And I'm not advocating for Lutheran teaching here. As a matter of fact, I don't believe it's a good teaching at all. But let me tell you where it comes from. First Corinthians chapter 7, when Paul was talking to the people of the church at Corinth, he was discussing the matter of whether or not a believing husband should stay with his wife if she was an unbeliever, or vice versa. If a believing wife should stay with her husband if he was an unbeliever. And one of the things that Paul says is that, look, your, your, your spouse is sanctified by your faith, meaning your spouse is going to be blessed because you have faith, meaning that there is something that God does when you are the sole believer, it makes your family different. And then Paul said this, otherwise your children would be unholy, but now they are holy. What did he mean? He meant that because Becky has faith, her son has 
been declared holy. That's what the Bible says. Now that's trying to figure that out is hard. But it says, and the Lutherans seized upon that, and they said, therefore, at baptism, there this will be a generation. The reformers said, that cannot be the case either, because again, the best thing that we could do would be to baptize them, let them be saved, and then keep them from ever hearing the gospel where they might reject it and be condemned. So, the Roman Catholics taught this neutrality, and then they taught what was a gradated system of becoming holy. Like, okay, you have to be baptized, and then you got to go to confirmation, and then after confirmation, you do your first communion, and then you got to go to confession. Then after confession, you got to do the... Uh, the, the uh, unction, the anointing, they call it holy unction. Anyway, and, all, and in each case, it's like you get a little bit more righteousness, a little bit more, and a little bit more. And when you do good things, then eventually you're going to get enough that you go into heaven. That's the way they teach it. Okay? And the reformer said that that is not salvation by faith alone, that's salvation by works. This is salvation through the church. And so the Roman, the, the reformer said, no way. And the, they said to this particular doctrine, well then, if a person is, if a person is saved by baptism, and that child is not exercising faith, but the parents are exercising faith, then this, there's something convoluted about that. Because again, it, it, puts all of the focus of salvation on what somebody else is doing other than Jesus. And so the reformer says, no, it's Christ alone who says, right? It's grace alone. It's not what we do. It's not the church. It's not the sacrament. It's Jesus who saves. So it can't be that this is true. All right, so we're going to come back to this a little bit. How much time is it? It's 10.13. It's time to stop. To be continued next week, come back for the exciting conclusion of what happens when children die. Okay? <laughs>